Seriously, guys, this latest trailer was off the chain! <laughs> <laughs> ah, no, for real, our new flagship, Arkveld, was actually chained up and also was supposedly extinct until now. What is going on? Hello then, my fellow hunters, and welcome as we uh, go through everything in greatest detailist. At least for the first time, because there is way too much here for any mere single video to contain. And look, let's be honest, we have to pass the time until the end of February next year, because I, it's, it's like four months, and what are we gonna do? It's just how do we. Okay, okay, okay. Let's get into this then as we open on our, I guess, actually most important new character, the boy. He goes by the name Natter, as we know. Initially just a mysterious boy that accompanies on our journey, now we know the flagship. Well, we have a little bit more to go off. In fact, him and the flagship is the central plot of everything we'll be doing. The fates of a people and nature intertwined. At the center, a boy named Natter and the mysterious White Wraith. Several years ago, a boy named Natter was discovered near the border of the Forbidden Lands, an uncharted region believed by the guild to be uninhabited. That's a scene I think we literally see later in this trailer when we find Natu on the ground, passed out, and a new high-up guild leader, literally a leader in the Hunter's Guild, is introduced, but we'll get to that. Nata recounts how his village was attacked by a mysterious monster, Arkveld, the White Wraith, our flagship. In response, the guild has organized an expedition to investigate. The hunter is assigned to one of the units tasked with investigating at this White Wraith and rescuing Nata's people, known as the Keepers. So yes, Nata's tribe is the Keepers. Either the Keepers of the White Wraith, again, that was chained up and thought to be extinct, or at least Keepers of knowledge of it. Or maybe just the Forbidden Lands in general. So we really do have quite the hook here, and I for one am all for some serious Monster Hunter with some serious narrative. The killing and the wearing of skin is good fun, let me tell you, but with purpose, it's even better. And I realize that a lot of this, you've just been looking at um, a questionable expression here on, uh, on the little Natter. So, uh, sorry about that, Natter. I didn't really do you any favors with this one. So, we get into this then, and we are rapidly taking him away from, supposedly, the White Wraith. That he was hoping he'd imagined it, and I assume that being the attack on his village. In the background then, crackling with uh, this purple power, he thrashes around, but we'll get back to him. For now, we get our Scarlet Forest base camp. We see the Aptanov, we see ourselves the Murnos perched on top, lovely from world, the blacksmith, our tent, the fooderies, and then we actually meet Olivia and her team. We've seen them before, of course, but now we know properly what's going on with them. They are simply another squad uh, that uh, the uh, new major sort of leader character in Fabius, that again we'll get to, has assigned here. They are known as the Astrum Unit, led by Olivia with her hammer, and Athos her palico, who is the greatest palico in the world now, sorry, Meowskiller Chef, and then they have with them an engineer by the name of Werner, who is pretty damn good when it comes to weapons, in fact, he's a leader in that field, and then a research, and then a researcher that goes by the name of Eric, who is also a particularly a good one and well renowned so we have got some serious personnel on this and it's really cool to see this sort of officially named now we as a unit are us our handler Gemma and so on and then there is this Astrum unit led by Olivia doing similar things to us we're two hunting squads investigating the new world at the behest of Fabius who has set up uh, the Forbidden Lands Research Commission so having our stories intertwined we see all these 
these cutscenes together. I imagine there will be a lot of perhaps working together, but maybe even some clashes in ways of doing things. There certainly is a lot of monster fighting uh, cutscenage with Olivia and her team. But for now, we move on to the Scarlet Forest proper with a... Then we move on to the canopy, which is so cool to see. Actual traversal atop the trees, which makes sense for it not to all just be these overflowing rivers, and with the new map that's much easier to navigate, and them saying they did that so the ancient forest wouldn't confuse people again if they ever did anything like it, and lo and behold, we have a very vertical greeny foresty map, so that has to be some sort of deliberate See, You're not gonna get lost now. And in any case, I do wonder if we're gonna actually do any fighting up here, some proper, like, hunting zones, or this is going to be a way to travel around the map from a relatively quicker and safer pathway. In any case, we then go down here and get introduced to the downpour. That is what this inclement weather is called, and it's the transitionary period for the Scarlet Forest, from the beautiful sunshine, tropical vibes, to, oh my god, I hope you brought an umbrella. And also, you know, a set of hunters, because when the weather is like this, the apex of the Scarlet Forest comes to play. But of course, when the downpour happens, the wildlife behavior changes. The wildlife you can find changes. The endemic life, the monsters, much like the Windward Plains, when it gets sandy, when it gets lightning-y. And everything starts to rush and flood, and we get our new little small monsters, which really do remind me of Baragalugabugu, the blood-sucker leviathan from Frontier, the sort of necks really give me that vibe and the colouring. Of course, these guys have their little spikes and they love to see it. More small monsters to round things out makes me happy and seemingly no big boy version is completely fine too. It just really adds to the layers of the ecology. There is a lot of them as well, so I do wonder if these guys like uh, the raptors on the Windward Plains will swarm monsters for you in the river. I could totally see that happening. Then we do get to our new apex monster of the Scarlet Forest and a new monster in general. This is Uthduna. And Uthduna is a leviathan. It rules the Scarlet Forest as its apex predator, is adapted to a water-rich environment, and it's sighted most often during the downpour, the rainy uh, mode for the map. It makes use of moisture and its own bodily fluids to create a protective veil around itself. And this thing is huge, it is beautiful, and it looks great while being hit by Olivia's hammer. For real though, it is a marvelous new Leviathan, and oh, the gold, the red, the scaling, the detail, a very Amatsu-esque ahead, but it does look like the beautiful child of both Namiel and Amatsu, and it has a really great did that bitch just hit me with a hammer? Expression that I can't get enough of. It's simultaneously terrifying and a little bit derpy. It's flowing, like fin extension limage is just perfect and reminiscent of a lot of types of fish that do have these display fins. The question is how it uses them in a battle. It clearly gets very angry and splays them out. I imagine that's its enrage raw, and it's just so large. Like very splashy, heavy, smashy, which is, of course, a technical term in how it operates, how it combats us. The big belly slam being the perfect example. And when you see it like this, it's just like a chubby little leviathan. What are you going to do? And then you realize it's going to break you in half. That's what it's going to do. I cannot wait to see its equipment. And I do think that we haven't seen the switch axe and hammer set monsters even yet at this point. So now we get to what I think is her arena. Oof Duna's final stand, her nest. Like Ray Dow has his little crystal, uh, little dent in the Windward Plains so that his electricity carries through to make him in his nest even stronger and more unique. Here with Oof Duna, well, you see this sort of barrier, this wall of rocks and twigs that the hunter's in front of. I think that's a wall that you can't go beyond. And beyond that is a much deeper lake-esque area uh, that the Leviathan can do these big 
big belly flops go deep into the water and summon this ultimate set piece-esque attack which is this wave heading towards you that you have to outrun or get over using your secret and that's amazing and it really does make me think that there is a theme here with the apex monsters of each map we have Ray Dow, we have Uth Duna, they have double names, they sound like names, not like species names, but actual name names of personality. We know that both of them have these zone dependent ultimate states where things really get going. It makes me feel like it's not just, oh yeah, Rathalos rules the ancient forest and Diablos on the desert, but they're normal hunts. Each of these apexes in wilds seem to really end in a climax, kind of like the end of Raging Brachydeos and Iceborne, where your final zone against them, or maybe along the way, depending on how each one works, has these moments that can't be replicated anywhere else with any other monster. Like Ray Dow's extra lightning crystal uh, cavey area, and now uh, this Oof Duna's tidal wave zone. And I think that is spectacular, really giving these apexes some serious significance and making that first hunt so memorable. I absolutely love it and I think however many locales there ends up being of which I think there's at least one more based on the rest of this trailer we'll get to every apex is going to be something special that is one of the best designs and executed monsters ever and I don't think that's like a crazy hot take to say that yeah Ray Dow and indeed Uth Duna and honestly everything we've seen for wilds but those two in particular are really already instantly in contention for the very best this awesome series has given us. Then we go to glorious sunshine. We're on holiday. We're having a great time. Warm, lush, greens, colourful. Oh yeah, if it wasn't for all of the, you know, giant monsters that might kill you, this really would be the place to be. But in any case, we get that transition back to uh, the luscious loveliness when the downpour is not happening. We see a new wing drake with beautiful blue wings that's uh, nice to have. Doshagama patrolling, showing himself here. We've seen him here before, but it's nice to see him again. The flowers, the foliage, the brightness, the color, the sunbeams, it's just brimming with life, and it's everything I want from a monster hunter. Then, yes, we have fishing, but you know, that's all well and good. We have this in the background, ruins. And they are big ruins. Obviously, we also have a massive, what looks like a rib bone, so that implies some large creature once existed there, so that's this whole other thing. But these ruins are quite big themselves. Obviously now worn away, overgrown, uh, but significant, I think, in that we are in the Forbidden Lands with lots of ancient tribes and peoples and customs, and I do think the past is a relevant theme here with the flagship and the whole main through point of what we're doing doing being these keepers with a monster they thought was extinct. I feel like the background might not just be interesting to look at but also help tell the tale of this ancient land and I absolutely adore that. And that gets reinforced in a moment where we see immediately more rocks uh, that are clearly like these pillars carved, the lines into them, fallen structures and the scale is huge. I don't want to immediately throw out the you know ancient civilization but certainly a ancient civilization. More of it built up a waterfall, which is quite the feat of engineering, as we now secret climb about the map. Then this. First and foremost, Wedge Beetle just kind of flying in the air, so I have a feeling they're just going to be scattered about. They don't need to be actually on something. We can just hook to them mid-air, which is ridiculous, the strength of these things. We have the Chatter Cabra, Sword and Shield, which is nice to see. Three more hunters running on through on their secrets. And then in the background, so many of these giant bones, and then the mountain is absolutely covered in these ruins. See what I mean when it comes to the scale of them? There is a lot going on here, and hopefully a lot to discover when we can actually walk around and find every nook and cranny. Maybe it really does lead to something even bigger. We know we can get to the Scarlet Forest through the river on the Windward Plains, so what if all of these ruins through this sort of mountainous region lead us to a third locale? that is just a giant ruined city. How exciting would that be? But for now, I also do think this zone we're seeing here is the non-downpour version 
all of uh, Oof Duna's uh, tidal wave zone. You can see the deeper water off to the right with that sort of barrier that the hunter can't cross where she could be doing these big belly flops and sending the waves going. I feel like it's that kind of vibe. In any case, we now have a poor paralyzed Alabrina that we're all going to haha <laughs> roll barrel bombs into. Now we see the bow hunter on the right. They are wearing what I believe we now know to be our next new monster's armor, the new brute wife, and that we'll get to in Quimitrice. It was very much up in the air whether it was a generic set or a monster set, but I do believe the bow set is Quimitrice's, so that's nice to know. But as I said, I still don't think we have Switch and hammers, so at least two more new monsters still to be revealed. And yes, for anyone who didn't keep up with the Gamescom gameplay, this was a reveal of rolling barrels, so that's fun too. Then the big set piece, like the waterfall in the ancient forest, the avalanche in the Horfrost Reach on that poor innocent Doshagama is really nice to see, and another big watery waterfall zone. It's nice to know that, you know, underwater combat isn't coming back, but sort of wading combat is, so yeah. Yay! In any case, yeah, that is impressive and I love it. Then, Foresters, you respect a new Linnean tribe, the Woodwood tribe, which is just great. The mushrooms, the dust, their outfits, their synchronized dancing slash pointing at the forest that is theirs that we need to respect. They are charming to no end and clearly important to the story because we end up in their base. Literally, it's the Woodwood hideout. It's an actual proper thing. There's clearly a lot of cutscenes with these guys. We found them rummaging through our tent initially from the looks, and then we have this, their home. I imagine they might like offer a service to us or teach us Palico gadgets, ultimate attacks. We know they're back from something we'll see in a moment, but uh, there is a lot to love here, and I think they will have a surprisingly bigger aspect, at least in the Scarlet Forest. Whether there'll be other Linnean tribes in the other locales is yet to be seen, but that's really nice to have. Then a load of palicos in the garb of the local tribes people, so perhaps, you know, local palicos running with a big hunk of meat that they just won't drop despite being attacked by, yes, a Quematrice, a new brute wyvern, and one I absolutely adore. Door. First and foremost, Brute Wyvern. Yes, we've got one, they're in, the Brutes are here, and there's a new one, so that's really nice. The skeleton variety just grows and grows and grows. But of course, Quematrice, Cockatrice, it is a big chicken dinosaur, and Quema is actually Spanish for burning or burnt, so that's nice too. Brute Wyverns with disproportionately long tails. They spread a flammable substance that ignite it by dragging their tails along the ground. They can often be seen fighting with other smaller carnivores over carrion and are chiefly found in the Windward Plains. So it's like a uh, smaller, more sort of realistic chicken glavenous, which I am all for. I mean, look at that fire as it spins. It's such a charming, fun monster, and I think it's really nice. This is sort of in the Chattacabra camp where it's, you know, quirky more than anything, and I love it. You need them too. And yeah, this is the armor the bow was wearing, so really nice to see it. The scaling matches up perfectly on top of this lovely glowing charge blade that I think just looks like a regular metal blade, but very nice to look at. Then we get ourselves the big Palico moves. A look at it. This is the auto revive. Instead of carting, your Palico will come over and give you a big Vigoros to give you one more chance. That was introduced in Iceborne, I believe. So seemingly we should have some sort of ultimate moves to choose for our Palico again. And again, the Woodwood tribe might come into that. And that's really nice to see. It's obviously a powerful little boon to have. So yeah, wonderful Brute Wyvern to see there, and just having another Windward Plains monster shown, i.e. there's so many new monsters, they're happy to just throw another Windward Plains out, even though we've seen like Balahara and Ashagama and Ray Dao, there's even more. So, how many new monsters is there going to be? In any case, we're back on the Scarlet Forest, we're in the downpour, we're with Olivia's team, and we find our flagship. This guy is... <laughs> 
Ooh. So, this is Arkveld, the White Wraith, a monster known among the Commission as the White Wraith. Described as having a unique chain-like appendage extending from its wings, a species long thought to have been extinct, its ecology remains a mystery. And a mystery is right. We don't know what it is. We have uh, the title of it, and uh, that is uh, the Chain Blade Wyvern. It's not written like Elder Dragon, so it could well be a flying wyvern or a question mark, question mark, question mark, or something new altogether. It's using the bulky frame of like a Tigrex, a pseudo wyvern, but like more Geismagormy, really hefty, and it can still fly as well as be really powerful with its wings. So so this thing really has a lot going for it. It has uh, this purple energy, which might well be a new status or element, like Malzano got your blood blight. They like to do that with flagships, really make them stand out. But what else makes it stand out is it has beaten and killed the apex of the whole Scarlet Forest, because it is chain-wrapped and holding a uh, Gog Dam Uth Duna, which is ridiculous as Uth Duna isn't anything uh, to write off. So uh, we confirm that yes, that's it. That's what we're looking for. The boy having his oh no, that's what killed our village. Flashbacks, and then uh, we see it yes, actually fly away, and we now sort of have our targets. So clearly, uh, I think we'll end up at the the Scarlet Forest as our second map, we'll get a glimpse of Flagship, and then sort of get the trail to then chase it to a third locale, which what makes me think there is at least going to be, yes, a third locale. Travelling on this flying ship, and then here is when we first find Nata on the ground at the edge of the Forbidden Land, having run from his village being attacked by the White Waith, as we then get introduced to, as I said earlier, Fabius, a leader at the Hunter's Guild, which is really high up and really impressive, like the general for Fatalis in Icebon, and a former really distinguished, capable hunter. So that's really exciting to get. But not as exciting as then him going after Ray Dow. So we've seen him kill the apex of the Scarlet Forest. He's now fighting the apex of the Windward Plains. Is White Wraith just going to go round and defeat every apex in battle? Because that is quite the little arc if that's true. Ray Dow seems to be putting up quite the fight. I mean, we don't know how much of a fight Oof Duna put up, to be fair. We only saw the aftermath. But this is happening in Ray Dow's nest with the crystals to spread the lightning. And White Wraith doesn't seem to care at all. It's got its chain whips, its purple energy, and it is battling. And then we have this, you're a hunter, you've got a weapon and you do nothing. It feels like they're setting up perhaps a conflict moment between us and Olivia. Maybe a different way of wanting to do things or a decision to be made that there might be a little bit of a riff that then obviously will ultimately get solved, but that's really interesting to see. We then move on to the Lala Barina Lance having a clash with our new Leviathan, which is really nice and really shows you the scale of this thing in this zone. A little bit of a hunting horn on Ray Dow, and then this, which looks like either a counter or an offset attack that the Hunting Horn has. He clearly clashes with that Raidow attack and is just fine, so that's fantastic alongside the Hunting Horn itself. Then Nata here wants something given to him. Is it an artifact? Some sort of object, item, uh, that uh, will help with or deal with Arkveld? That's uh, something very curious. What does he want to do with it? Clearly interrupt this Raydow Arkveld fight, but how? It very much seems like Arkveld is on top here, but we don't get to see any more as we are chained in to the logo. So yeah, a lot is happening. Obviously with Arkveld having those chain whips like the whips found in Frontier on a few monsters, so seeing that come across is lovely. Him thought to be extinct is like origin species, which essentially are just extinct species in Frontier, so that again is really, really nice. So the past playing into it, and I am just all for this story-driven wilds experience. The splash art is incredible. Why was Arkveld chained up? How did he break Break free. What does the Keepers, the tribe this boy is from, have to do with it? Will there be a surprise further Elder Dragon after, or for once will the flagship be it? We've still not seen a new Elder Dragon, probably. Oh my god! 
Oh, February 28th can't come fast enough. It really, really can't. There's so much to think about, so much to speculate on, and I just want to do all of it. And I will, but also secret decorations. Confirmation of secret customization, which I'm sure we all wanted, we all wondered about. I just hope it'll be possible in a way that isn't getting the deluxe pack, but at least seeing it is a thing that can happen is really, really nice. Oh, then we have the three versions of the game. The only thing of note here is that the background is each of the three main stages of weather in the Windward Plains getting worse and worse, being all clear, ending with the lightning storm, so that's a nice way to do it and something to look at. But yeah, there you have it, everyone. A proper little deeper dive on some more of my expanded thoughts on this trailer. A bit more still, you know, high level overall. Some theories, some big sweeping things to point out. When it comes to literally that thing in that corner, that pixel is this, which is cool. That is coming up and we will find everything worth talking about for you guys. So look out for that very soon. But for now, give me your thoughts, your hot takes, your story theories. What's going on with these monsters, these characters, this world? because for the first time, well not the first time, but for the most it's ever been in Monster Hunter, there really is a lot to figure out when it comes to the narrative, and that is phenomenal. For now though, like you've enjoyed this, subscribe and hit the bell for more, consider supporting the future of the channel on Patreon down below, and until we meet again, a good bye. <laughs> Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement To take our insanity and turn it into entertainment Yes, I said entertainment twice To reiterate that it is nice To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis When you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage Is, uh, goodbye